The 2016 election year in Ghana witnessed several campaign strategies adopted by the various political parties with the aim to convince the electorate. What have I been doing? I have been doing and doing and doing. This one, you can call him a doer. So, this election, it is one doer versus two promises. We have to save Ghana from John Dramani Mahama and secure the future of our The Ghanaian voter was bewildered with promises from various campaign platforms, especially from the two leading political parties, the MPP and the NDC, as they head for the polls on December 7, 2016. The results were finally declared. On the basis of the foregoing figures, and by the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, and the returning officer for the presidential election, it is my duty and my privilege to declare Nana Adudankwa Akufuado as the President-elect of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you. God bless our homeland Ghana. On the 7th of January 2017, the President-elect Nana Adudankwa Akufuado was sworn into office with many hopeful his government would deliver on its promises. the government is right. These taxes probably are new some taxes. And they say that numbers are not important. Numbers are very, very important. And I did not, for the life of me, think that we would ever get to the 110 figure. I will not judge the government by what will happen in 100 days. We have a Minister of Agriculture, we have a Minister of Fisheries. I don't know what next we are going to have. Maybe Minister in charge of plantain production. Where would they get the extra money if they are not able to seal the loopholes. But I will check corruption. Without infrastructure, without deploying teachers to support this policy, quality will definitely be compromised. The 63rd day of the Akufo Addo led government recorded a total number of 110 ministerial appointments, the biggest size of government since independence. The president faced criticism on the size and the cost of running a big government. I quite frankly think that appointing so many people to ministerial positions is not the best way to go. If you compare Ghana with any advanced country like United States of America, we have more ministries than the richest and the most powerful country on the surface of this planet. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. And they say that numbers are not important. Numbers are very, very important. Keep the government lean, make government efficient, save the public money, and stop saying that numbers are not important. Ministry of Transport, for example, can take care of aviation, can take care of railway development, and yet you have Minister of Transport, you have Minister for Railway Development, you have Minister for Aviation. How many planes does Ghana have? How many passengers pass through Kotoka in a day? What kind of aviation industry do we have in this country to have a minister responsible for aviation? Now, look, the Minister of Agriculture, we could conveniently bring fisheries and the Minister of Agriculture together. To be honest with you, the more people you have, the more difficult it is to coordinate their activities. We have a Minister of Agriculture, we have a Minister of Fisheries. I don't know what next we are going to have. Maybe Minister in charge of plantain production. I did not for the life of me 
think that would ever get to the 110 figure. I'm actually more because as you know, there may be new regions that will be created. I mean, why have seven people handle Ministry of Communications and Information? Why? Is there a minister for WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? I don't get it. We should stop this practice of saying, oh, numbers don't matter. The numbers don't matter is the, how effectively they were. It is even in the interest of the presidency to have a small, cohesive government, number of ministers, whose activities can be very easily coordinated and supervised. President Nanado has severally expressed his commitment to empower Parliament to deliver on its core mandate effectively. Some suggestions on ways to build the capacity of Parliament were made when we interacted with Dr. Jonah of the Institute for Democratic Governance. The Ghana Parliament has two sets of weaknesses. One of them external and the other one internal. So we refer to these as relational capacities. The relational capacity refers to what capacity does the Parliament of Ghana have vis-a-vis -vis the executive, the presidency, for example. If you scrutinize the relationship between Parliament and the presidency, Parliament is so very weak. Why? Because the Constitution mandates the president to appoint the majority of his ministers from among the members of Parliament. And so these are people who belong to the executive. So the executive will take a decision they will, as part of the executive, they will take a decision and rush the Ghana parliament to come and vote for it. We need to change this. And in fact, very many good suggestions have been made. For example, the Constitutional Review Commission said that the relationship between parliament and the executive is working to the disadvantage of parliament. Therefore, in the view of the members of the commission, the number of ministers who should come from within parliament should be reduced. Unfortunately, we have closed our eyes to this very important recommendation by the Constitutional Review Commission and the Constitutional Review process itself has stalled. But apart from Parliament's relationship with the executive, that is the external relationship, internally, Parliament itself has so many weaknesses. For example, a member of Parliament anywhere in any democracy, developed democracy, will have a number of assistants who help him or her to do the research that he or she may need to be able to contribute effectively to parliamentary work. This is not the case in Ghana Parliament. In Ghana Parliament, what they do is they engage national service people collectively for the House. So no individual member of parliament has a number of assistants attached to him or her to do the kind of research he needs. This is a major weakness, and I think we should be able to address this as quickly as possible. It is not only that, but Members of parliament, you know, the, 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 the work they do is both within the parliament and outside parliament. They have constitu constitu constituency relations. So if you are a parliamentarian, you do your work inside parliament, and at the same time, you must be catering to the interest of your constituents. A member of parliament should have enough funds available to be able to employ people who go between him and his constituency. He may. He can even set up a constituency office, office located right in the constituency with staff who are able to communicate whatever it is that the constituents are concerned about effectively. Can you, members of the Ghana Parliament, don't, they, don't, they cannot afford this. And so we have internal weaknesses of Parliament and we have external weaknesses of Parliament. The external weaknesses relate to Parliament's relationship with the presidency, with the executive. But within Parliament itself, so many weaknesses. Take a look, another look at... Um, for example, the library of the Ghana parliament. In every democracy, the parliamentary library is the biggest and the most famous library. The library of the House of Commons, the library of Congress, these are the top libraries in the world. You go and take a look at the Ghana, Ghana, Ghana parliament library. It is, uh, uh, somebody call it a two by four chamber. <laughs> a two by four chamber, inadequately equipped with the latest journals and the books and so on and so forth. And so members of parliament are not able to do the kind of research they need to do before they can make the effective contribution on the floor of the house. But Nana Ado, since he has decided to build the capacity of parliament, must look at all these problems one by one. Do our members of parliament have enough assistance to help them do the kind of research they need to do before they can deliver their functions within parliament effectively? Do members of parliament have assistants who go between them and their constituencies 
and then do uh, members of parliament have a very respectable, well-equipped library. These are problems that they need to look at, not, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, when they finish their A and they are getting their S gratia, that, that, that has become the main concern. There are very serious problems that we need to do to make the members of parliament very, operate very, very effectively. The MPP's 2016 manifesto also promised to establish by an act of parliament an office for a special prosecutor who will be independent on the executive to investigate and prosecute certain categories of cases and allegations of corruption. Questions on the independence of the special prosecutor have been raised. If we are having an independent prosecutor, it should be truly independent, an independent prosecutor that has a tenure of office that will not feel um, that the executive will interfere with their work. An independent prosecutor also, that also is accountable to the citizens of Ghana at the same time. An independent prosecutor that has the resources that they need to work because we always talk about these institutions having difficulty because they do not have the adequate resources. So if we create another structure that is resource strived, then it also makes it back to the same issues that we have already. So how do we ensure that the independent prosecutor gains some uh, independence so that even where corruption is detected, even in the executive, the independent prosecutor can boldly, boldly in, in, in caps, uh, pursue uh, that without even having any fear. The first 100 days has also seen a wave of several coalition efforts in clamping down artisanal miners who operate illegally. There is mounting evidence that some Chinese nationals are involved in this illegal trade, also known as galamsei. The activities of these illegal miners has contributed to the pollution of our water bodies over the years. This situation has led to an uproar within the media space, with calls on government to arrest all involved, including the Chinese nationals. While I suspect that the Chinese just do not care, because you do not care. If you cared about your externalities of polluting the rivers, I'm sure the Chinese would have cared. This is a matter of resource allocation. Clearly speaking, you cannot have bureaucracy sitting far away from lands in Accra, dishing out concessions to people who the locals do not even know, and the locals who are probably mired and wired in poverty sit around and watch and clap. It will never happen. All over the world where there have been issues of this kind, the, way, the best way they've been solved is, has been the involvement of the locals in the solution. And by involvement of locals, I do not necessarily mean that in stopping Galamsey, you need to involve locals. In actually making it a livelihood, a meaningful livelihood, you involve the locals. Look, in Southern Africa and part of East Africa, there was extensive poaching of animals, wild animals. And you know, these wild animals were basically the doyen of tourism for these countries, and they make lots of money from them. Now, locals do not understand why the state will allow foreigners to come in, as they call it, trophy hunting, pay $100,000 to kill the buffalo, for instance, and the state appropriates all of that, leaving virtually nothing for locals. Who actually live within these areas where these uh, hunting is done? So what did the state do? They decided to involve the, the locals in not just, of course, the management, but also in the sharing of revenues. And that is how come poaching significantly eased. So the moment you make something illegal without thinking about the root causes, I'm sorry, you come back to the same issue again. I think the best way to solve Galamsey is to first of all decentralize our mining laws. Make sure any mining that is done must involve the locals and the locals ought to take that decision. So if it's a local district assembly or community leadership, 
that is the only way because if they understand that mining has externalities like polluting the rivers and their livelihoods depend on these rivers they will understand it we have to solve the fundamental issue of decentralizing mineral rights and ensuring that locals partake in the proceeds the spoils that is how you organize property rights One core element of the NPP's education program is free education for all Ghanaian children up to senior high school. This is to ease the burden on parents and guardians while encouraging them to assume their responsibility for the social upbringing and parental control of their children. I think their commitment to education is, is unquestioned. I think the commitment is there. It's about the timing and the manner in which the actions or the initiatives are being taken. When you look at the sector, right from the foundation, the early grade, there are so many challenges. For instance, we have an issue with a high number of untrained teachers in the public schools. Most of the teachers who go to the public schools, when you, when you go to the early grade, you find that the majority of them are not trained. And because there's, there's a shortage of teachers. You find that even those who are trained, when they go there, the head teachers will find a way to send them to a higher class. And so those are the, at the very basic level. They don't get the right kind of training for the kids right from the, from the beginning. And it reflects as they go up. Because when you look at national education assessments, when you look at the performance of the children, and you compare it to the BEC and the WASI, you see that there are similarities, which show that if the foundation is not done right, it's, it will reflect as we go higher. A major promise by the MPP during the run-up to the 2016 general election on education was the free senior high school policy. Details of the policy as given by the president after the election revealed that the only beneficiaries of this policy come September 2017 will be the 2017-2018 year entrant of all public senior high schools. Speaking to a final year pupil of a junior high school, continuing students of some senior high schools and an expert in the sector, they had this to say. I'm excited about the free education policy since I'm also part of the first students who are going to enjoy the policy. It's a good policy since students from poor backgrounds can get access to the secondary education. But also another point to check is that Ghanaians, we don't value free things. When the things are free, we don't put in our best effort. And the second part is that we should add quality to it. I pray that everybody will see it as a good, as a good policy so that they add quality to it and be good students. I feel very happy about the free SHS that is coming. Because many of us, uh, our mothers do not have money. In case, because of financial problems, uh, some of us, uh, we, we have the knowledge to go further. But because of the money that our mothers do not have, uh, our parents do not have, uh, we cannot further our education. And so through the SHS, uh, it will be a privilege for all of us to move ahead so that we will achieve our destiny through the free SHS. The free senior high school education policy is a very good policy, but I, I wish that the government would have extended it to those who are, we, who are already in school. So I will, we will also enjoy some and benefit from it. To start with um, first year students without making provision for those who are already in the system. It raises equity issues. And for us in the sector, I think when we look at the sustainable development goals, equity is a key principle which must be, must be considered. So whilst we are looking at access, we should also look at quality and we should also look at 
the equity issues involved. The 2017 budget allocated 400 million cities for the implementation of the free senior high school policy come September 2017. Imani Ghana and the Ghana National Education Campaign Coalition raised concerns on what the allocation sought to address and the sustainability of the source of funding respectively. If you look at the free SHS policy in total, what the 400 million looks at is only goods and services. But if you take into the entirety what free SHS mean, you are looking at issues about access, infrastructure, and quality issues. If you take quality issues, which has to do with teaching and learning materials, a lot is needed. Currently, the allocation, um, a substantial part comes from the oil revenue. As to whether it's going to continue like this over, over the long term, it's another issue. We have to take into consideration the fact that oil sources, it's a finite resource. It will come to an end at a point. And so we need to find a way to sustain it beyond um, one government. You know, we do not want the situation where we'll start um, this free SHS, another government comes and says, oh, because we do not have money, so we have to take it, take it off. With sustainability of the source of funding, investment in infrastructure and equity earlier raised as areas that need attention, other issues to be considered while we await the rollout of this policy come September 2017 focus on the following. From the assessment we have done as a coalition, it's expected that enrollment will increase um, considerably. And without infrastructure, to support without deploying teachers to support this policy, quality will definitely be compromised. Already, um, when you look at the education sector performance reports, they have already stated that there was a decline in performance in the WASI um, in 2014-2015. And so we really need to look at the quality issues, the fact that Currently at the SHS level, student to textbook ratio is about 0 0.5, meaning two students must share a textbook. And this, the average, when you go to the deprived schools, it's, it's worse. And so these are issues we really need to look at. Much as a lot of promises have been made and the president has stated that he's in a hurry to fulfill these promises, we believe that when it comes to education, we need to take time to consider the repercussions of, of these policies, of these promises, before we, we implement them. Because education is, is such that it's a shared responsibility. It's not within the purview of governments only. Parents have a role to play. Teachers have a role to play. There are so many stakeholders involved. And so if we do not consult all the stakeholders adequately, and we rush through, we only find that these initiatives um, will fail. We have lessons from the implementation of the free compulsory universal basic education that we can learn from. There are so many lessons. And so the government should take its time and consider all these things to make sure that the policies are, are well implemented and they near to the benefits of all Ghanaians. We've done much with access, with programs like school feeding, free uniforms and all those things, but we are in the age of sustainable development and it's about time we focus more on quality education, where we have quality outcomes. promised to reduce and reform a number of taxes which they have broadly followed through by announcing 16 tax incentives in its maiden budget. Majority of these tax cuts attempt to incentivize a private sector-led production. The government is right. These taxes probably are new some taxes. So if they are being removed, to begin with, I don't think it is going to affect revenue that much. And plus, it has the potential to boost the private sector. The challenge, however, lies in the extent to which the private sector responds to the tax stimulus. 
Already, concerns of a volatile Ghana city poses a threat to realizing the full gains of the tax incentives as investor confidence is yet to be restored. The Ghana city, though, has achieved relative stability towards the end of the first quarter of 2017. When it comes to depreciation of the city, you are looking at the short term and the long term. Of course, you all know that in the long term, you have to be able to diversify our exports. If you could, in fact, industrialize export manufacturing items, you know, basically changing the structure of the economy. That will what will stabilize the city in the long term. But in the short term, what is causing the city instability is the fiscal imbalance we are having. The deficit have been so high. And if the deficit is high, you tend to borrow. So domestically, you'll be competing with the private sector. Internationally, there's interest payment that you need foreign currencies to service your debt. All these things bring the instability to the city. So in the short term, to be able to stabilize the city, you need to put your fiscal situation in order. Amidst the MPP government's tax cuts agenda is the government's plan to increase tax revenue by 33.6% over the 2016 outturn. 33.5% revenue growth looks a little bit difficult to achieve, given that revenue has not been performing quite well since 2013. Nevertheless, if you look at history, probably starting from 2001, 33.5% revenue growth is not out of work. To achieve this revenue target, the MPP administration promised to broaden the tax base by formalizing the economy through the establishment of a national database. Against this background, the government has allocated 100 million cities in its maiden budget to revive and roll out the National Identification Scheme, the NIS. It also intends to implement a National Digital Addressing System, NDAS, in 2017. Aside implementing NIS and NDAS, the government must critically address the challenges in the Ghanaian business environment and the disincentives hindering businesses in the informal sector from entering a culture of compliance. The government must therefore increase business engagement to improve information availability on the formalization process. The issues of low trust in public institutions and perception of institutional quality must be addressed. Corruption, weak rule of law and lack of accountability are some of the excuses people use to justify tax evasion and also increase transparency and education in the tax collection process. One of the best ways they can raise revenue is to go back to the districts, go back to the drawing table and ensure that property taxes. In fact, the vice president is on record to have suggested that they will digitize all properties in the country. That's not enough. That alone will not bring you money. What you need to do is to go further to ensure that there's proper valuation of all landed assets. And once you do that proper valuation, you'll be able to determine the realistic rates that should be charged, and that way you pull a lot of funding. Over the years, the inability of successive governments to generate enough revenue to finance its growing expenditure has plunged the country into huge fiscal deficits. Fiscal deficit at end December 2016 was 8.7% of GDP. The new government has projected a deficit to GDP ratio of 6.5% and has decided to resort solely to the domestic market to finance its deficit and even to pay off some of its external debt. And there are positives and negatives when you're borrowing domestically as compared to foreign borrowing and vice versa. When you are borrowing internationally, there is exchange rate risk. You can run into exchange rate risk in the sense that you borrow today, the exchange rate is stable, but the time that you want to repay, the exchange rate is unstable and the CD is depreciating. In that case, you need more and more and more CDs to be able to change it into foreign currency to service your debt. But then in the short term, when you're doing international borrowing, the benefit is that in the short term, you get inflows of um, foreign currencies, which will help to stabilize the city in at least in the short term. But when you are also doing domestic borrowing, you tend to crowd out domestic investment because the same funds that private, the private sector needs to borrow. So when you are doing so much borrowing domestically, you'll be competing with the private sector 
interest rate will be increasing. The government's interest that it will pay on the debt is going to go up. The private sector too will have to also borrow at a very high interest rate and it could affect growth. Though the Bank of Ghana has revised the monetary policy rate downwards to 23.5% for the first quarter of 2017, much needs to be done in order to facilitate access to credit and hence boost economic growth. Domestic borrowing must be carefully phased out with strict limitations on arbitrary borrowing. The function of the credit bureau in the financial industry must be strengthened to enhance the availability and dissemination of credit information. In the medium term, the government must expedite its efforts to deepen the financial market as promised in the 2016 NPP manifesto. Funding options like corporate bonds and municipal bonds can be exploited by the private sector and state institutions as a source of external long-term financing and as an alternative investment for banks. With a consistently high fiscal deficit experience over the years, the Nanado-led administration promised to introduce a fiscal council to bring sanity to the fiscal process. Looking at the history of public financial management reforms in Ghana, is a fiscal council sufficient to address the fiscal indiscipline in the country? When you enact these laws, establish these councils, and the commitment to achieve sanity in the system is not there, then not much can be done after all. The existing structures are sufficient enough to ensure that sanity is achieved in the system. But the problem we have currently is the commitment, the dedication on the part of the government to ensure that um, those things we call laws are at, at least implemented. They are ensured that they are working. If such a thing happens, then there will be sanity. Then fiscal stability could be achieved. But if you do bring all these institutions into play, into the scene, but you allow them not to work as they are supposed to be, then it will mean um, those things are just institutions and you will not be gaining much from them. In a nutshell, to put the economy on the path of growth, the government must fix the fiscals, cut down the deficit, remove waste in the system, in the short term, much of the problems we are experiencing now is because the deficit is too high. We need strong fiscal consolidation. If you're able to fiscally consolidate, cut down the deficit, minimize borrowing, then at least you provide the enabling environment for other things to start working. Healthcare delivery in Ghana has witnessed significant progress with a decline in maternal mortality from 467 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2000 to 319 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2015. This is largely due to the introduction of the National Health Insurance Scheme, free maternal health care and increased investment in health-related infrastructure. The National Health Insurance Scheme introduced under the Kufo-led administration was to make provision for equal access to health care for residents in Ghana. As of June 2016, active membership of the NHIS was 11.2 million, representing 41% coverage, with government increasing its funding by 15.84% from 2015 to 2016. However, there are frequent cases of the National Health Insurance Scheme being in constant areas with service providers. The major challenge is the politician. We pay premiums, we pay taxes, the 2.5% of VAT goes to that. Unfortunately, year on year, these funds that are ordinarily called EMAC funds are not necessarily EMAC for the various projects they are supposed to execute within the National Health Insurance Scheme. And secondly, as long as we keep recruiting people and keeping the fees the same, as in the taxes that feed the scheme the same, it will still have the challenges it has. Samuel Zan Akologo, the Executive Secretary of the Department of Human Development, National Catholic Secretariat, believes that aside the delayed disbursement of funds from government, the pledge on overhead costs and infrastructure form the bedrock of these challenges. The problem of the national health insurance is not just the quantum of money, but it is about the prioritization of important services. 
In my opinion, I think the national health insurance is spending too much on overhead costs and infrastructure. So you go around and you see the level of buildings, the kind of transport, the, the number of staff who are employed. My question is, is that critical? Is that fit for purpose? So I think what we need to do is look at how the National Health Insurance Fund can actually be applied to those providing the services, rather than spending all of that, uh, so much of it, in uh, overhead and administrative costs. With the foregone factors identified as problems plaguing the health insurance scheme, what are the best solutions out of these quagma? Introducing private pathways to ensuring sustainability of the scheme. By private pathways, it doesn't necessarily mean you need private practitioners to handle it. All you need is that the premiums that are paid, uh, if you like, differentiated in such a way that those who could afford more, pay more for better services, and those who cannot afford more, get help from the taxes so that they can also get some decent care. Eliminate dubious claims, eliminate corruptible practices. When you eliminate uh, dubious claims and you have proper ways of verifying and making sure that you do not accumulate areas, pay as and when they come. Moving forward, are these recommendations enough to help government fix the challenges with the National Health Insurance Scheme? I will give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that they have... Um, they have a basis for us to hold them to, which is the uh, manifesto promise. We have heard some statements uh, in the State of the Nation address. The budget is an important instrument to deliver what they have promised. But my strongest view is, let us not leave it to them and say, oh, with all of this, they will do it. I think what we need in this country is civic vigilance, the agency of citizens really making demands and consistently so, and making sure that governments will deliver what they have promised. If we wait and just think that they will do it only to lament, I don't think that is good in, enough. I do not know of any single government anywhere in this world that would do everything for the common good without prompting from citizens, without a system of checks and balances, and pressure, including pressure. Mr. Speaker, probably the most difficult problem that has dogged this nation in the past five years has been in the energy sector. This has caused havoc in small, medium, and large enterprises. The attempts by the previous government to resolve the crisis have led to a gargantuan debt overhang in the sector. We have inherited a heavily indebted energy sector. Imani sees an alignment in the government's campaign promises to deal with the indebtedness of power utilities and its 2017 budget, where it proposes the implementation of a credit risk assessment framework to guide borrowing of state-owned enterprises in the power sector. The president indicated in the State of the Nation's address that the government would explore the option of listing these companies, specifically Volta River Authority, VRA, and Ghana Grid Company limited critical on the stock exchange. Will the listing of these utilities on the stock exchange significantly improve their performance through the elimination of inefficiencies? When you take power for instance, there are certain challenges. One, the finances of the utility companies as at now, VRA, Greco, ECG owe about $2.4 billion. So how do we clear that debt? How do we make sure that the debt does not come back again? So putting in place certain steps uh, so that the debt uh, does not return. We think that government should have a subsidiary of VRA which will control the thermal component. Now that subsidiary can be listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange. One, it can raise money to pay off the debt of VRA. Two, it can bring in additional experts. Government can be a majority shareholder, maybe 51%, 49 but other aspects will come on board. The third one is that it can improve the corporate governance. I mean, at the stock exchange, you have to publish your report 
almost quarterly and people can scrutinize, CSOs can scrutinize. So it can help bring some efficiency into the sector. Budget trends over the past couple of years have displayed an impetus towards increases in power generation capacity without corresponding efforts to solve other pertinent issues plaguing the power sector, including insufficient fuel stock to feed thermal generation, transmission and distribution inefficiencies, amongst others. This has resulted in excess power generation capacity of over 1,000 megawatts. Are there any short and long-term effect of this bill up in capacity on the power sector and economy? Whenever we sign these contracts, we have a component we call capacity charge. When you take Ameri, for instance, we pay $9.9 .9 million per month as capacity charge. Now, whether you use the plant or you don't use it, these are charges you have to pay. So the World Bank estimates that it will cost Ghana about $2.5 billion annually. That those are plants we will have but we are not going to use. So one, we're going to waste money. Two, we are going to pay for things we are not using. And the third one is that it's going to have negative impact on our tariffs because all this cost buildup have some reflection on the, on the tariffs we pay as consumers. In making recommendations on how the erratic power supply could be abated, Dr. Ishmael Aka, head of policy at ASEP said. We have to renegotiate some of the contracts we signed. Some of them are very expensive. So government should take steps to renegotiate them. That is one. Two, whenever we sign contract, we normally give them what we call provisional licenses. And at times we give you two years to maybe put your plans down. There are companies we signed agreement with them as far back as about seven, six years ago, and they're still not operating. So we have to also meet such companies and review. That one will reduce the excess capacity. That is the first one. Now, if we have a window to renegotiate, we should renegotiate down for most of them to convert their plant to use natural gas instead of crude oil. Because when they use natural gas, it will cost cheaper, and that will also mean that we're going to pay a cheaper tariff. Again, with Sankofa gas coming, about 185 million cubic feet coming next quarter, uh, next year, the first quarter of next year, and 10 gas, also 50 million cubic feet coming this year. Uh, most, if plants rely more on gas, I mean, uh, cost of production may reduce, and it's also going to affect our, our tariffs. The fact is that we produce more than we need, and what we have to do is to sell the excess to other countries in the sub-region. Already, Cote d'Ivoire is doing an average tariff of 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Nigeria is doing average tariff of 17 cents per kilowatt hour. Ghana is doing 42 cents per kilowatt hour. So if we don't negotiate some of these contracts down, and in fact, when we want to procure additional capacity, use competitive bidding so that we can beat down price in future is going to affect us since we, are, we cannot get market to even supply our power to. Dr. Aka, in commending the government on its promise of increasing the renewable energy supply source, he called on government to reduce cost of energy to industries. When you look at the MPP manifesto, they promise that they're going to fix solar panels on all public buildings so that you don't even get electricity bills at all. Nothing was said in the State of the Nation or the budget about that. But we think that that is something, if they do, can help. Again, they promised to invest so much in renewables. And when you look at our energy sector plan, we're supposed to get 10% of our power from renewable by 2020. As at 2017 March, only 0.5% comes from renewables. So this year, the government promised to take it from 0.5 to 3%, which is very laudable. So that is also a positive. But again, the tariff, they reduced the public or street light levy by about 2% and the electrification levy by 3%. So it won't make much difference. There's a VAT of 17.5% on the tariff of commercial users. We think that government should have either reduced that or remove it so that those who use power for productive purposes can get cost of, lower cost of production. They can even employ more. Unfortunately, nothing was done about that. Investment in renewable energy. When I say investment in renewable energy, I'm not saying that we should build very large solar parks. I'm talking about generated yourself initiatives. For instance, people are putting up uh, real estate. Can we have some negotiation with them? 
every new building you put up, you put solar panel on them. Then we fix what we call net meters for all these people. When you generate 100, but you consume only 70, you can sell the rest to government. That alone can lead to efficiency. That alone can take so many people from the grid so that the grid can feed industry. That alone can generate jobs for people. The first 100 days of the Nanado Dankwa Akufu Addo presidency has seen commitment towards achieving promises made in its 2016 manifesto with budgetary allocation and announcement of promises and programs. Given the natural challenges every government will face, especially with financial resources, it may be well prudent for the administration to focus on deliverables that will have lasting transformational impact. As an organization that believes promises are quantifiable, Emmanuel will continue to keep track of political promises.